Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for still being here. Much appreciated. So I'm based in the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London, and we have the honour of being the world's only purpose-built institute for palliative care and rehabilitation. That's our building there. Uh, we have a walk-in patient and family information and support centre. Anybody can walk in during office hours, get information and support. We have our own lecture theatres and seminar rooms dedicated to palliative care rehabilitation, full um, multi-professional clinical team, and about 45 academics working solely on rehab and palliative care. So it's a kind of quite exciting environment for us to be in. So, in terms of the advent of ART and what that's meant, it's meant particularly in the UK, I'm sure it may be the same in Canada, policy shifts expecting people with HIV to have full social and economic participation. But very importantly, the contribution of physical and mental health to quality of life and living with HIV is seen to be a current critical challenge for HIV medicine. And some data from the last World AIDS Conference that I reviewed showed that there are a number of emerging physical complications which are presenting significant challenges for people living with HIV. And going forward in clinical practice and research, there's a lot of us for us to think about in terms of what do we mean by clinically important? What matters? What should we be assessing? What should we be measuring? And there's been a couple of nice studies by Justice in the US showing that physicians tend to detect about a third of a patient's problems. And when we conducted this study called Positive Futures in the UK with about 400 gay men living with HIV, we asked them about what do you need going forward living with HIV to have a future and to achieve it. Things like we need less ignorance and more understanding from the HIV doctors about things like side effects and mental illness, improved clinical services, particularly around mental health, need to rebuild confidence and self-esteem, need to find a way for a mental structure to move forward in every area of life. So ART is indisputably important, but it's not the end of the story. I have a particular interest in pain and symptoms in HIV. This is a study of nearly 800 patients we conducted in the UK. Outpatients in London, we can see a really high prevalence of lack of energy, feeling drowsy and tired, difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating, diarrhoea, sexual activity and pain. Clearly very... Um, difficult problems and we can see on the right hand of this slide the proportion of people who are ranking these problems at the most distressing um, values on the scale. This is the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale. So really high prevalence of outpatient problems. When we look at the psychological problems for the seven day period prevalence we have a high prevalence of worry, sadness and feeling irritable and again, a high impact of the burden of those, feeling constantly or frequently bothered by worry, sadness and, and irritability in the previous seven days. So some key messages from that data set we had, the 800 patients. We've also published some data showing that there was a 31% seven-day period prevalence of suicidal ideation. Very importantly, somebody said yesterday, what about the link to adherence? I think it's our key in palliative care and rehabilitation. If we can show that what we do impacts on adherence, people will listen to us. Those are the key things, I think, for us to be hooking on to. And importantly, with our studies, with our, our cohort in the UK, we've shown that risk and poor ad adherence are associated with pain and symptom burden, very, very importantly. And also, we've shown that symptom burden is predictive of viral rebound. So I think these are key messages for us to use to try and advocate for what we do. And I've been collecting this data around the world, Argentina, London, Uganda, Uganda and South Africa, and I'm finding the same kind of prevalence. All this data has been published, same roughly prevalence of pain and symptoms. We're just starting the work now looking at quality of life in Kenya and in Vietnam also, but it's a global story that pain and symptoms persist. Interestingly, in our cohort, we used the Euroqual 5D, which has been criticised recently for being too functional as a measure of quality of life. And I also have to say that one of the criticisms might be that it has a ceiling effect, so people score overly highly on this. However, taking that into account, when we look at the five dimensions of the Euroqual in our UK sample, we have about a third saying they have mobility problems, around a 20% self-care problems, around a third usual activity problems, uh, about 43% pain and discomfort, and well over half anxiety and depression. 
so clearly these uh, distressing problems. And very interestingly, with the EuroQual, you have a visual analog scale. Score your general health today on 0 to 100. We can see that somebody's um, ranking of their own general health is significantly associated with their mobility, their usual activities, their pain and discomfort, and their anxiety and depression. And that model alone, with those four items of the five dimensions, accounts for about half of the variance in people's um, rating of their own health. And when we add in other variables that into the model, we keep mobility, usual activities, pain, dis uh, pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression affecting how people rate their general health. But we also find that there's um, a significant association with treatment optimism. So those that are more optimistic about treatment have a better rating. Having a sexual partner, don't know what we would do in an intervention study there. Can we give everybody a sexual partner and they might feel they have better general health? Uh, but really importantly, no significance for ART use and CD4 count in how people rate their general health. Important message. So, what about measuring what matters to patients and families? PROMs, patient report outcome measures, are essential to quality and equity in the care that we deliver. They help us assess, evaluate, monitor treatment and care, help us make decisions, and also, really importantly, when we ask patients what matters, it helps us to educate other clinicians. And I'd argue strongly that we can't, appropriate, we can't um, deliver appropriate care without knowing what matters to the patient. Any of you that read the BMJ, there's been a big head-to-head -head in the last couple of weeks. I've published something in, kind of people being um, very headstrong about whether we communicate difficult information to patients or whether we should be more paternalistic and hold on to that information. But you can read my arguments for yourself. But we do need scientifically robust and valid outcome measures. What do clinicians need? They need something practical, user-friendly, something simple, not something that's complicated and leading you in all kinds of different directions. So outcome tools must meet our clinical and research needs and not make them more complex. So where I'm coming from in the world of palliative care, and this is a quote from a colleague of mine that I work with at the University of Maryland and the Institute for Human Virology, looking from the life of the virus and instead to the life of the host. So understanding a patient's physical, social, emotional and spiritual problems where arguably we'll get optimal quality of life. And really importantly, palliative care and HIV, as with other diagnostic groups, is from the point of diagnosis alongside treatment to the end of life when it comes. We have developed a palliative outcome scale, and this is just a snapshot from a large European project that I've been leading across nine countries in Europe and Africa, working in large-scale public surveys, 10,000 members of the public, anthropologists to understand preferences in um, outcome measurement, clinicians to understand their preferences and priorities, people in long-term care settings, clinicians in symptom measurement, to try and drive forward best practice and outcome measurement. And if you go to the PRISMA website, there are all kinds of things that you can download freely in outcome measurement support. And I've been working for a number of years on the evolution of African outcome measurement, which involved systematically reviewing the literature, then talking to clinicians about their priorities for outcome measurement, then talking to clinicians about the most appropriate features of outcome measurement, developing a scale across eight countries in Africa, and then completing the validation in nearly 800 patients. So you can see the evolution of an outcome measurement and its validation is quite an investment of time, but we've ended up with the psychometric properties of consensus validity, face validity, test retest validity, sensitivity to change, understanding time to complete, keeping it brief, internal consistency, and as I said, we've validated this in a large cohort of patients and the family caregivers with a group of academics from um, Africa and America. We've just this month completed the first paediatric outcome scale, which has just been validated in six African countries. And now with Harvard, we're just beginning the Vietnamese POS, and the Thai POS has just been completed. There's an Australasian one, a Hindi, European versions. So there are many POS resources you can use. I'm having... Ah, oh, there we go. So what can we do with an outcome scale? This is data from a really large public health evaluation I did for the US government, 1,400 um, HIV patients in East Africa. We used the palliative outcome scale to understand what their main problems were. We can see help and advice to plan for the future, pain, ability to share feelings. 
I'm going to show you the data now from these two randomized control trials that I've tried to do something about this in Kenya and in South Africa, one in a very poor township in the Cape Flats, one in Mombasa. Just presented the data for the first time in Washington this week. Nobody's seen it before. I've got the psychosocial data here for you. And I can show that if we use simple training with an existing staff and an outcome scale, we can improve psychological well-being here using the GHQ-12. We can, include, we can improve social well-being, so help and advice to share, to plan for the future and share how we're feeling. We can see a really highly significant effect over four months, both in South Africa and Kenya for that. And we can show for the area under the curve a great improvement for the study arm using both the MOS HIV, mental health subscale and the GHQ-12. And really importantly, what's going on here when we analyse the qualitative data, patients talked about stigma. Somebody talked to me like I was a real person. They asked me about my problems. I'm holding my head up high. I feel better about living with my disease. Very, very interesting outcomes, and I'm really pleased, and we've just got that this week. I want to share this with you from the rehab side of our department, and you can download this freely from the Royal College of Physicians, trying to look at concepts of neuropalliative rehabilitation and how for patients with long-term neurological conditions, the long-term support is coming from rehabilitation, working with other specialties and perhaps palliative care towards more advanced disease stages. And I'd wonder how this works for HIV because it wasn't modelled for HIV, but it would be worth considering this. So if we want to think about how we integrate different specialties, this is an interesting kind of life circles model that we might want to consider. Um, within the rehab department, they've done a lot of work on developing and validating outcome scales. There's the rehabilitation complexity scale, which measures care and risk, nursing, therapy needs, and medical needs, and also just completed validating the FIM and FAM for the UK and validated the goal attainment scaling, which uses a DISC system to see how much, to, to, to what degree goals are being achieved. So all of those validation studies have just been completed within the rehab side of our department. We have the UK Rehabilitation Outcomes Collaborative, or UK ROC, which is a national clinical database. We have a five-year grant within our institute from the National Institutes of Health Research for specialist rehabilitation in the UK. We hold the database on every specialist inpatient neural rehabilitation episode in the UK. And the aims of that, the four aims of UK ROC, are to collect the inpatient episode data for specialist rehab services in England, to help us because commissioning is key now in the UK, so it's helped to help us generate a commissioning data set and work out payment models for the UK government. Also to help us do benchmarking on the case mix of presentation to patients, the outcomes and some of the cost benefits. Because <clears throat> as we know, costs are absolutely essential for us to understand if we're going to convince people of the utility of what we do. And also to help us plan service and plan capacity of services. So future considerations, we were all asked, I noticed yesterday, what are your three points? So I've been thinking about what my three points might be. So my questions would be, what outcome measures are used internationally? So maybe the UK and Canada in HIV, both in research and in practice. How much can we collaborate and use the right measures? Or do we need new measures? Do we need to adapt to the ones that we have? Can we collaborate more closely on outcome measurements so we can share our science in how to develop and validate outcome measures and perhaps use the same ones? And how much can we integrate with current rehab outcome activities? So, for example, the UK ROC is working across conditions, and I know Simon's group is contributing HIV data to that. So how much can we integrate with existing outcome activity? How much do we need separate activity? How much do we need new tools? How much can we use old tools? So I think there's a great amount of work that we could do very gainfully on developing our outcome measure approach. Thank you.